respected uh, professor siddharthan the principal of the college professor smita haridas the hod other distinguished uh, professors and uh, teachers and my dear students good morning to all and uh, it's a great privilege and pleasure to be here to inaugurate the current association of english titled the astrophel so with the support and consent of all the distinguished gathering here let me declare that the association for 2019 20 academic year astrophel is uh, open we are in a very important moment in our social and cultural juncture as the principal has mentioned earlier the ta- the title of uh, the discussion or talk today is writing culture and the people so this is related to again as professor siddharthan has mentioned earlier this is related to our society and culture and politics at large as students of humanities as students of literature and culture we need to be aware of the problems and the imminent dangers that are emerging in our society we are already into a crisis a cultural and political crisis in which the whole nation is actually suffering the people are in danger we are in extreme peril the situation is alarming in many parts of the country protests are growing and the kind of totalitarian culture the culture of intolerance as the principal rightly pointed out the culture of intolerance is booming in the country the culture of hate the culture of intolerance and uh, parochialism especially our poets and uh, our pioneers of the nation like rabindranath tagore for example the poet who even came to kerala to meet uh, our renaissance leaders like narayana guru he has made that plea in early 20th century that we need to be caring and loving human beings first we are citizens of the world and not a narrow nationalist kind of a sect we need to grow beyond this parochial nationalism into that heaven of freedom he prayed that my father my, my country let my father awake that was the prayer of tagore in gidanjali that is why he was uh, appreciated by the whole world and he was given the nobel prize also in 1930 but unfortunately because of narrow mindedness because of this intolerance because of ignorance ignorance of reality ignorance of history because of the erasure of the real history and the plurality of india unfortunately we have fallen into the danger of totalitarianism and uh, even fascism that tries to annihilate the other by propagating various narrow narratives on identity and culture so culture is a key word is a very important word which we have to uphold that is the importance of edutachan also this college that is named after tunjath ramanujan edutachan his intervention during the 16th century it was really a kind of liberating endeavor of course there are multi dimensions to it but as a linguistic community is concerned 
Erdogan's intervention was very important in creating a modern society in Kerala at the wake of the colonial encounter, especially with the coming of the Portuguese and the Dutch in Kerala. But this social formation, this social formation of Kerala, unfortunately became partisan and again became parochial and uh, the forces of Hindu nationalism, the forces of Hindu chauvinism, for example, it has appropriated the legacy of Erdogan. And also, only even the Renaissance leaders. It is today trying to appropriate Narayana Guru's teaching or Ayengali's interventions in modern times. So everywhere you find this struggle of culture, the struggle for liberation, the struggle for revolution, and also counter-revolution, as uh, the Marxist scholars or Baba Sahib Ambedkar, for example, in India have pointed out the revolution and counter-revolution, it is happening in India. And unfortunately, the forces of counter-revolution, the forces of jingoistic and chauvinistic nationalism, they have gained upper hand by creating a kind of majoritarian communalism in India. So the history of communalism in India from early colonial times onwards, we need to decipher, as we need to decipher the writing in India and South Asia. That is another key topic and accent in the lecture, writing. How culture and the people, the struggles of the people, the survival and life struggles of the people are related to writing. We are students of literature and culture and therefore we also need to know about the history of writing in India. The legacy of writing and letters in India and Kerala. Our Renaissance leaders like Poigay uh, Lapachan, for example, who came from the, the bottom of things in Kerala, a Dalit leader in early 20th century, a contemporary of Narayana Guru and Chahadar uh, Nayapan and others, he has mentioned about the legacy of writing and letters. Not just George Orwell or Philip Sidney. Philip Sidney is Astrophel, that is the title of your association, the Renaissance culture of Europe. And we also need to think about and rethink about and critique the le legacy of Renaissance in Kerala also. So that is why I have mentioned from Erutachan to Poigay Lappachan and beyond the Dalit poets of Kerala, the women poets of Kerala, all the Bahujan poets of India, they have all struggled to uphold to the principles of truth and justice. And that has culminated in the proliferation of these ideals, the modern ideals, the modern values of democracy, for example, liberty, equality, and fraternity. The modern democratic ideals that are enshrined in the constitution of India, which is the basic document of justice, basic foundation of ethics. It is the only ethical contract between the people and the nation state, the written down constitution. So that is why writing is very important. We need to write down the edicts, like Ashoka has done in BC 3rd century. He was the first emperor or ruler of the people who claim that ethics or dharma is going to be my principle, my guiding principle for governance is nothing but ethics, the dharma as taught by the Buddha. So this legacy of modernism, modernity as change, 
not exactly modernism because it is in present times it is used to refer to certain literary and uh, cultural or artistic movements that is what modernism is all about but modernity is the keyword that refers to newness of thought progress in human developmental indicators and uh, the focus on reason reason vivek as uh, the recent documentary film by anand patwardhan has shown you have made this wonderful promo video i appreciate your good efforts and the creative spirit shown by the students and you need to make more videos and you need to upload it to youtube and uh, the public sphere the internet so that the whole world can uh, see and watch it and understand you also need to make more films short videos short films documentary short documentaries you need to produce them so i was talking about that uh, distinction between modernism which is largely a literary and cultural movement of the early 20th century in literature and the fine arts in particular and modernity is the larger discourse modernity is the discourse of progress and reason vivek you should have vivek or reason as patwardhan is uh, appealing to us we have lost sanity we have lost reason that is why the people who are speaking reason they are silenced whether it is women like gauri langesh or narendra dabolkar or govinda pansare or kalburgi or innumerable other fighters for justice and truth and reason those who held on to reason in times of intolerance and insanity and 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 insane kind of turbulence they are being silenced by the forces of this chauvinism this ultra nationalism who are claiming the monopoly of the nation and uh, nationalism so this nationalism is not going to give us any welfare and peace this kind of nationalism narrow nationalism that tagore warned that is why i invoked tagore in the beginning tagore has also written not just gitanjali but he has also written prose critical prose in which he has uh, described this kind of parochialism as a nationalism of danger nationalism is not a solution he said it is not a panacea but it is a menace it's a menace it's a, a, a threatening thing it is a disaster it's a danger this will lead us only to the gallows and the killing grounds only to the concentration camps that are built in various parts of the country today not just in the northeast or assam but even in karnataka the gas chambers are being built auschwitz as we know about the european genocide and the classical fascism this fascism of india is getting much much worse than the classical fascism of the nazis and the fascists in it the nazis of germany under hitler and uh, the 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 fascists of italy and the benito mussolini but this kind of emerging of the state the state apparatus and the corporate world this has happened that is one definition of fascism that uh, applies to mussolini's italy the classical fascist days so they have built auschwitz in various parts of europe and they have exterminated almost 6 million minorities there that is the official statistics almost 6 million minorities jews gypsies others of europe the outcasts and untouchables of europe communists transsexuals fighters democratic kind of strugglers all those people those who descended against those who said no against this kind of genocidal classical fascism of europe they were wiped out completely they were sent to the gas chambers to the auschwitz in the wagons and they never returned they went out through the uh, the chimney as smoke and dust 
So that kind of gas chambers are being built in the country today. And we cannot afford to be silent. So we need to speak out. We need to say no to this kind of intolerance and insanity and, uh, uh, and uh, violence in Bhakti. So this is the context in which we are discussing about writing, the legacies of people and the importance of the culture, cultural struggle in particular. Because culture in contemporary academia, in the contemporary critical humanities, in literary and cultural studies in particular, it is seen as a site of struggle. Culture as a whole way of struggle, says E.P. Thompson. E.P. Thompson and Raymond Williams and uh, Richard Hoggart and Stuart Hall, these scholars have created a new discipline in mid-20th century in the Western academia. At Birmingham School, they have created something called the Cultural Studies School. Cultural Studies, those who are studying literary theory and uh, new formations in the English studies, you know. The old kind of canonical literature and literary studies have come to an end. And now you are studying culture inst instead uh, of the old canonical, colonial canon. You are studying other forms of culture. Where culture is seen as ordinary. Culture is seen as a democratic paradigm. There is no hierarchy of high culture and low culture. Everything comes under culture. That is why Raymond Williams at Cambridge, a student of F.R. Lewis, he called culture as a whole way of life. You have this uh, famous statement. You cannot be neutral on a moving train by Williams. So you need to speak out. You cannot be neutral because you have to take a position. You have to be polemical and you have to hold on to certain things. So that is why William said, you cannot be neutral on a moving train. You need to take a position. You need to stand with truth and justice, as Antonio Gramsci, another great Italian thinker and uh, philosopher has written. You have to take a position with the people. The people, again, a key word from Antonio Gramsci, Italian Marxist uh, thinker who fought fascism and who was uh, uh, imprisoned by Benito Mussolini and he died in that prison house of the fascists in Italy for speaking against fascism. So as Antonio Gramsci has cautioned us, we need to stand with truth and justice. Those who are denied truth and justice, we have to stand with them, with the people. The people is a key term from Antonio Gramsci or the subaltern. He used the term uh, the subaltern as a synonym for the people. The people or subaltern, that is the expression from Antonio Gramsci. So the people who are subjected to the hegemony of the ruling classes, they are called the subaltern or the people, the common people, the people at the bottom, the lowest uh, uh, lumpen proletariat, if you use that term from Marx himself, the lumpen proletariat, and also those people who are marginalized on cultural grounds, on socio-cultural grounds, people are alienated. Alienation or marginalization is happening in various parts of the world on a variety of reasons. So those people who are subjected to the cultural consensus, the cultural rule of the elites, they are also called the subaltern. So in India, for example, if you think in terms of culture, the cultural turn was created by Antonio Gramsci. Earlier Marxism was focused on only the economic criteria, that is class. But in various parts of the world, in Europe, class could be a decisive factor. It is true. Class, economic class, the ruling elites, the middle classes or the borsha, and the working class, the proletariat, that is the regular class structure in classical Marxism. 
it is also called the base and superstructure marxism it talks about the economic base and the all the superstructural elements or the ideological elements like religion or region or nationality or language and other ethnic kind of factors are seen as superstructure so the basic theory of marx and engels is that if you change the economic base you can change the the upper part the superstructure of the building it's a an analogy from architecture the base and superstructure but this was slightly changed and uh, corrected by antonio gramsci because there was no concern for ethnic and cultural things in the classical marxist imagination or theory so gramsci provided the insight that marginalization and exclusion of people impoverishment of people deprivation of people alienation of people is happening also on cultural and social factors if you study italian history for example you will know that is why gramsci in his prison notebooks in the prison house of benito mussolini he was writing it somehow uh, they smuggled it out of jail and it was later translated into english and french and various modern european languages and it reached the world only after the 1950s unfortunately gramsci perished in that prison but in that prison notebook gramsci pointed out the importance of cultural consensus hegemony is not exactly economic hegemony is also socio cultural kind of consensus and uh, regime it is a regime and rule by the elites in which even the victims are complicit because the victims are part of it they are complicit they cannot question it because it is normalized as culture as the norms and practices and conventions in a particular society it is socio cultural so that the people are also co-opted and the victims they cannot challenge it that is the cruciality the critical difference in hegemony as against direct domination it is not a direct domination it is not a mere class or economic exploitation but it is further nuanced and socially embodied it is engendering as gender is a kind of condition gender studies experts judith butler or michel foucault for example they talk about the engendering of the sociality or the nation space the girl child is conditioned in a particular way by the patriarchal society and uh, patriarchy is normalized whether in the institutions of uh, social institutions of marriage or family or uh, this what you called endogamy as ambedkar would point out the caste endogamy that is practiced in india from the classical vedic age onwards which is enforced by the manusmriti and the geeta and the purusha sukta in particular so these kind of cultural regulations invisible and intangible kind of conditioning that is the so this hegemony is a very important concept that would explain the traditional cultures of patriarchy and aristocracy especially in the asian african world so that is why antonio gramsci's concept of hegemony and subaltern these things have become keywords in the neo left movement and the neo left academia that emerged after uh, the theoretical revolution and the revolution of the students and the other minorities in the west especially in the 1960s the 1960s uh, students uh, uprising in various parts of the world in paris for example south africa for example in which plenty of student leaders were killed like steve bicko of south africa we know about nelson mandela who 
fought against the apartheid or the what you call the, the, the racist regime of South Africa. So this kind of racist regimes were there even in America. And in America the minorities like African Americans. Today you are studying Bell Hooks or Maya Angelou. Still I rise, she wrote. I know why the caged bird sings, Maya Angelou wrote. I know why the caged bird sings. It sings of freedom. And she also wrote about that phenomenal woman. I am a phenomenal woman. Because I have sustained, I have uh, uh, succeeded all the traumas of slavery. Slavery was the... Modern day slavery was a creation of colonialism, European colonialism. And colonialism was a direct creation of capitalism. Again, European capitalism and its external boom, outward expansionism created these colonies and colonialism and slave labor was invented. Modern day slavery was invented by this European colonialism. And that is why people from Africa, they were enslaved and uh, they were taken to the American continent for plantation slavery. So all these struggles of the people, whether it is the African American in the United States or the colonized people in various locations in Africa or the struggling people in India or Pakistan or Indonesia or other parts of South Asia, these changes, decolonization has happened in mid 20th century. A counter and critique of colonialism. So the colonial encounter has enlightened us on many grounds. As Gayatri Spivak and others have argued, colonialism is a decisive point. That is where we need to locate literature also. The advent of the Portuguese and Dutch and French and the British in, in Kerala, for example. This has had tremendous changes in the socio-cultural fabric in the country, in Kerala, for example. The caste slavery was here for thousands of years. India was reeling under the yoke of internal imperialism called Varnashrama Dharma, which is enshrined in the Vedas. In Rigveda, in particular, in the first Veda, in a mandala called the Purusha Sutta, you have this Varnashrama Dharma as the principle, as a foundation of the Hindu imagination of the nation. You have the fourfold Varnas coming out from various body organs of the, 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 the cosmic spirit called the Virat Purusha, the God. The Hindu God is imagined as a Purusha Sutta, as a Purusha, Virat Purusha or Brahma Purusha. And that Purusha gives birth to various Varnas, the fourfold Varnas that is called the Chatur Varnya system. The theory is called Varnashrama Dharma. Even Gandhiji wrote a book legitimizing the Varnashrama Dharma. He published it and uh, sold it from his Navjeevan press. Even after meeting Narayana Guru in Kerala in the 1920s, even after getting that insult from the Kanyagumari temple by a simple Brahman priest, even after Sahodaran talking about, about the riddles of Rama and Krishna to Gandhiji at Palluriti when he visited Kochi, even after that uh, he was very much fond of that Varnashrama Dharma system. He thought Varnashrama Dharma is something divine. Only the untouchability and pollution must go. But that is a kind of uh, what you call the, uh, an ideal case. It is not practical at all because Varnashrama Dharma divides the society. It is the theory that ultimately divided Indian society and created these various strands of inequality in India which is called the graded inequality by Ambedkar, for example. Ambedkar has written multiple volumes on this caste system in India. And he has also inquired about, he probed about the origin of this Varna and caste in India. 
His theory of untouchability is there in the works called Who Were the Untouchables? Who were the untouchables? How they became so? We don't become untouchables by ourselves. We are forced to become untouchables. This humiliation, like Kobal Guru and others talk about humiliations, this humiliation of the human, it is enforced on us in the name of religion. As Antonio Gramsci, talking about the religious or other ideological structures, the cultural conditioning that enforces this hegemony. So this is a typical case of hegemony in India, the caste and varna system of the Chaturvarnaya. This is normalized and legitimized, justified in the name of religion. This is called the Varnashrama Dharma. Dharma is religion in Hindu terms. Dharma is equal to religion and principles of religious morality in particular. So this Dharma in Sanskrit, this is nothing but religion. So Varnashrama Dharma, Varna, the most dividing, degrading, dehumanizing category was enforced on us, on the people in the name of Dharma or religion. That is what we need to understand. So that is how the Indian hegemony, Perry Anderson and other contemporary Marxist critics, they talk about this Varnashrama Dharma, this graded inequality that Baba Sahib has pointed out, this inequality of caste and gender that the Indian feminists have pointed out, from Uma Chakravarti to Sharmila Rege, they have critiqued this double-edged sort of priestly patriarchy in India. Ambedkar has also mentioned about the, Bra the concept of Brahmanic patriarchy, which is now being used extensively by the Indian Dalit Bahujan feminists. Sharmila Rege to Anupama Rao, they are widely using the term, the critical term that is enhanced and developed from Ambedkar's own writing. So this hegemony, Indian hegemony, is a double labyrinth. It's a double kind of hierarchy. It is a hierarchy of caste and also a hierarchy of gender. Gender, as I have pointed out earlier, gender studies, for example, reveals that it is not natural, but it is a normative practice. It is a cultural conditioning. So all these things, whether it is the caste and dog army, whether it is this, uh, what, what you call the heteronormativity, or uh, the fear of the, the transsexual, the transphobia, everything, it is all constructs of the authoritative voices in the society, the authorities of patriarchy and priestocracy. Brahmanism in India, or Brahmanic patriarchy, in India is the ideal classic example of this normative practice, this unequal institution and hegemonic discourse in the society. So that is why we need to critique, we need to deconstruct the power structures and the cultural elitist discourses of patriarchy and aristocracy in India. It is creating inequality and it has created the division in the society, divide and rule into imperialism. It's also called scholars like uh, Swami John Dharmadirtha, for example. He was a student of Narayana Guru. He has written and published a work called The Menace of Hindu Imperialism, the history of Hindu imperialism, in which he identifies this Chaturvarnia project of Brahmanism as an internal colonialism or Hindu colonialism proper. So we need to address both the issue of European imperialism. It was, of course, an exploitative agenda. It was harmful on many grounds. It created the inequality of the world and divided the world into uh, the rich northern hemisphere of Europe and the poor south, the tricontinental inequality. The Asia, Africa, Arabia, this kind of inequality was created, of course, by European imperialism of 400 years or maximum 500 years after Columbus. Tony Morrison, for example, the American Nobel laureate, an African-American woman, 
won the Nobel for uh, the novel. She has written about uh, the 500 years of silence regarding the European imperialists after Columbus, the invasions, the Spanish conquistadors in America, the Amerindians and the First Nations of Canada and the Aborigines of Australia and various ancient people, they suffered a lot. Plenty of genocides were there. Modern day slavery was invented by colonialism, which was an outgrowth of capitalism, as I told you. Vladimir Lenin has written in 1916, even before the October Revolution of 1917, Lenin has written a treatise called Colonialism as the Highest Stage of Capitalism, European Imperialism. So from Lenin to Franz Fanon, an Algerian revolutionary and a, 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 and a West Indian Caribbean thinker and psychiatrist, to other scholars like Edward Said, for example, a Palestinian Asian American scholar at Columbia, who has written the Orientalism and Culture and Imperialism and other important works of the post-colonial studies, who pioneered uh, post-colonial discourses in the Western ac academia, in Colombia in particular in the U.S., to our own uh, critiques like Gayatri Spivak and others, they have enlightened us about the importance of the colonial encounter and of course about its uh, traumas and also the enhancing aspects. That is why I mentioned uh, Spivak's essay, The Burden of English. She has written that essay, The Burden of English, in which she talks about English both as a medicine as well as a poison. It's a poison in the sense that it is a language of the colonizer. We study it because British colonialism was here for 200 years. But because India was under the shackles of caste, because the vast majority of people, especially women of all Varnas and Shudra, in particular, and the Chandalas and other minorities in India, they were denied human rights, full-fledged humanity, human status, even human status, they were not even considered as human beings. They were subhumans, that is the word subaltern also referred to the other and the undermined, the other under, it's an Italian word, originally popularized, used by Antonio Gramsci. So, the majority of people in India and uh, almost everywhere in Africa and various South Asian countries, they were having these age-old cultural inequalities. Traditional cultures of patriarchy and aristocracy. These things were ruling in India and uh, South Asian regions. That is why European imperialism also provided a space for modernity in the these Asian African countries. So that is why even post-colonial critics like uh, Gayatri Spivak, who is from India, later she went to Colombia and uh, the West, even she acknowledges the medicinal aspects of modernity and English in India. It is poisonous in the sense that it was an old colonial language there are harmful colonial elements that we need to reject, that we need to critique and deconstruct and totally reject the colonial dimensions of authority that is inscribed in the language. At the same time, we also need to embrace the liberating aspects, the positive aspects of English and modernity. That is why she said it's both a medicine as well as a poison. And also, in, a, uh, in another text, she talks about the colonial encounter as an enabling wound. It is enabling or liberating. At the same time, uh, it is a mutilation of the body. It is a wound. It's a cut. It's an open wound. So that is why they are writing. The post-colonial writers are writing about this just 200-year-old uh, British colonialism. But if you look at the liberation of the people in India, the people, the Sabaltan, the Shudra, women and Chandava and the Mlecha, in Brahminical terms, Mlecha means the followers of other religion, especially the Buddhists. Buddhists were 
fashioned as or dehumanized as the mulch that is why you have in the bengal hindu chauvinistic renaissance in the vanga renaissance you have the 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 legacy of the vande matara legacy in which uh, bangim chandro anand mart rajmohan's wife and in other narratives he has included that prayer called vande matara but the mlechan murchayate that description is the the other the religious other in particular especially the buddhist and later in modern times the muslim in particular they are referred to as the mlecha and you know what abicha one mlecha is used against another mlecha amicha and his children jains they are a minority in india and they are the foot soldiers of rss and the hindutva brigade so one mlecha a jain is used against another what you called archetypal mlecha the muslim this is the divide and rule strategy this is how hindutva divides the society and it forces brothers to fight against each other and it drinks the blood so it is a vampire as many dalit bahujan scholars in india from gopal guru to kancha ailaiya for example they have written about it why i am not a hindu a shudra critic of hindutva and its uh, political economy kancha ailaiya a professor at osmani he has written about it gopal guru one of the greatest political scientists after ambedkar in india who is a professor at uh, jnu he has written about this caste humiliations and the importance of the ambedkar phule savitri bai legacy the legacy of the people the bahujan dalit bahujan legacy the majority of people in in india yesterday was the birthday of uh, savitri bai phule one of the earliest teachers lady teachers in india in modern times there were several teachers in the past especially in ashogan times the buddhist nuns were the you have the teri gadha in the tipitaka so in modern times after the uh, the conquest of brahmanism by the middle ages from the 8th century onwards especially in south india these legacies of the changam literature and the ancient enlightened uh, tradition the prabuddha tradition of south india was undermined by the brahmanical patriarchy and everything was lost but in modern times when the britishers came mahatma phule emerged he got education english education in the school run by the scottish missionaries and he learned english language and he wrote against the caste inequality he wrote gulam giri or slavery the caste slavery and it became a debate in british parliament and he educated his own illiterate wife savitri bai and then she became the first lady teacher they initiated the schools for dalits and dalit girls in particular in western maharashtra so that is how the bahujan movement the indian renaissance social reformation that is why he is often called the pioneer of indian social reform so that is entirely different and he was a direct beneficiary of english and modernity which is a legacy of uh, british colonialism in india and in kerala when the missionaries intervened in nanjinada for example south travanku then the nadar women they got the knowledge and awareness that they are women they are human not just women they are human and they began to dress up like modern human beings they began to cover their breasts in public which was uh, prohibited by the caste laws the caste hindu system was preventing uh, the human rights of avarnas in particular the avarnas are not exactly hindus they became under the hegemony of hindus by the middle ages they are having the greater legacy of enlightenment they are originally buddhist people that is why they are having they are outside the varna system they are not mentioned in the chaturvarna system 
only the subservient fourth varna shudras are included as the fourth varna even the shudras are denied education and the art of letters writing in particular that is another what you call the knowledge power monopoly of brahmins I mean, it prohibited not just education but even the art of letters art of writing writing itself was prohibited in the cosmology of brahmanical patriarch only memorization rot memorization of the smriti shruti purana that is why it is called smriti it is never written down it is never codified like a legal document or the constitution of india or a history there is no history at all only mythology is and this smriti shruti puranas the textuality of hindu imperialism it is preserved in the memory of the brahman priest or the brahman pandit male even brahman women were not given access to reading and writing and the art of letters but if you look at the other legacies in india if you look at the muslim cultural tradition of kerala they are taught letters from the uh, childhood onwards girls are also sent to the madrasas and they are, they are taught the arabic script so this is the difference that is why i said from the ashokan times onwards from the time of the buddha and after buddha buddha lived in bc 6th century and after buddha in 3rd century bc ashoka emerged as a political patron of uh, this legacy of ethics and enlightenment in india he made the dharma or the ethics as his constitution and he made it in edicts he put it in rocks he actually engraved it on stone that is why it is called akshara because it is uh, never going to wither away it is something eternal when you craft and engrave it on stone it is there to last forever so that is why the dharma libi the dharma libi emerged writing script emerged in india with the advent of an enlightened cultural spiritual discourse called buddhism so the writing in india is a legacy of buddhism because writing was popularized when brahmanism vedic brahmanism in particular it prohibited the art of writing even for the aristocratic pandits only memory smriti and shruti you know memory and uh, something spoken shruti the spoken word the phonocentric tradition which derida for example he critiques the phonocentrism and logocentrism of western metaphysics but this was practiced in india in a more wretched and uh, reductionist fashion by the aristocratic patriarchy called brahmanism only memory was practiced no writing was entertained manusmriti even prohibits uh, even listening to the letters if a shudra listens to the letters or chanting or vedic chanting or any educational discourse uh, molten lead must be poured into his ears that is the punishment given by manusmriti the hindu law the brahmanical law george bahler has translated it into english you can read the laws of manu it is the penguin they have published it penguin india you have the laws of manu by george bahala translation english translation where you find nastri swadandre marhati pita rakshadi kaumare bhartro rakshadi yavane ah putro rakshadi vardhakke nastri swadandre marhati she is put in that lakshman rekha the indian english poet uh, torudat torudat from bengal she has written that lakshman rekha in which lakshman draws a Uh, around around sita and she is supposed to stay within that limit this is the the well round or well rounded circle around women in india this was the status of women in india that is why even baba saheb has written about the hindu woman the rise and fall of the hindu woman and all you can read plenty of documents are there. so the art of writing was prohibited to the people especially to the shudra even chattamishwami 
ഈവൻ ഇൻ നയൻറ്റീൻ സെഞ്ചുറി മിഡ് നയൻറ്റീൻ സെഞ്ചുറി ചട്ടമ്പി സ്വാമികൾ വാസ് ഡിനൈഡ് എഡ്യൂക്കേഷൻ ലൈക്ക് മഹാത്മ ഫൂല മെൻഷൻ ഏർലി ട്വൻറ്റി എയ്റ്റ് നയൻറ്റീൻ സെഞ്ചുറി ഇൻ മഹാരാഷ്ട്ര Mahatma Phule, Jodhir Rao, Govinda Rao Phule, he was such a wealthy and prosperous kind of a person there, coming from the middle social strata. But the Brahmins identified him as a Shudra, even Shivaji was a Shudra. They called him Shudra Raja also, Shudra Maharaj, and they levied certain taxes. When Shivaji and Sambhaji, when they have to give some taxes to Brahmins and appease them, otherwise next year, they will call him again shudra maharaja again he will have to give that money and gold like the murajabam and the tuladanam and the hiranya garbham of travanku the marava kings they used to appease brahmans through this ritualistic uh, pujas and uh, what you call the the fees murajabam free chapad and other things on tax money it is levied from the breast tax of avarna women from the head pole and the breast pole of avarna people these taxes are collected or from the minorities as the the pepper tax mulagu vadishila the pepper tax mostly christians or muslims and other bahujans and dalits they are working in that agricultural field and the pepper kind of export and all so it is the breast tax of avarna women nangala nangeli for example in chertala in early 19th century she committed suicide she chopped off she had to chop off her breast so that she can refuse that tax and uh, she can return the tax payer of the travancore maharaja and later it was uh, it was withdrawn after the suicide of many women after the sacrifice of nangeli of chartala an avarna woman a, a, a woman of breast even today you have that malachi param uh, is there in chartala there is a cross road in chartala in alappi district you can go there and find the place where she lived and the legend is still on and plenty of such struggles the darawa kula massacre for example that happened in waikim 1800 and uh, 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 9 1806 is the sacrifice of uh, nangeli 1809 200 avarna youth they were simply butchered they were unarmed youth they were protesting against the uh, so called prohibition on public roads especially uh, around the shrine at waikam which was a buddhist mahayana vihara or palli till 16th century only in mid 16th century 1539 it was made reconsecrated as a shaivite shrine and the people they the avarna people who were alienated from their palli or vihara they tried to enter that space they were for the freedom of movement they were protesting for the freedom of movement and uh, the entry into that public shrine which was a buddhist shrine like ma like uh, shabarimala or tirupati or guruvayur or all the other palani all these shrines they were all mahayana buddhist shrines they began with ashogan times as uh, early buddhist or theravada style shrines or stupas ashoka has made uh, some 84000 stupas all around south asia some of the stupas and edicts and uh, pillars ashogan pillars you will find in the national museum if you go to delhi you will find plenty of ashogan pillars there even in uh, sanadi in karnataka you have the greater stupa the where ashoka's portrait is uh, is along with his uh, uh, royal queens and consorts you have the portrait relief of ashoka and uh, beneath that in dharma lipi in dharma script which is later it was called brahmi script by indologists and other epigraphist epigraphy is the study of writing the study of various writing styles and scripts and brahmi or the dharma lipi used by ashoka Ashokan Brahmi he is the mother of all scripts in south asia that is another important issue and pali language which was used by buddha to preach his gospel is there in almost all the languages in south asia even in malayalam even in contemporary malayalam which is a mixture of tamil and sanskrit and various other languages some 20% words 
are directly drawn from Pali language or Arthamagadhi. It is it belongs to the ancient Prakrit languages of India. It is not exactly related to Sanskrit, but it is ancient than the Sanskrit. Sanskrit is a refined, modified and refined and elitized, cultivated form of the Prakrit. That is uh, the linguistic way. You can have a sophisticated, cultured and refined language from a, a raw kind of linguistic root. So Prakrit is ancient than the Sanskrit kind of tradition. Sanskrit is the language of priestocracy. That is why even in Sanskrit plays, in Kudiyatam for example, women and uh, the Shudra or the Blecha or the Avarna, they are speaking in Prakrit. You know about Nangiyar Kutu and Chakyar Kutu and Kudiyatam. You look at uh, the text of even the text of Kudiyatam and the performance in particular in Kerala, Women are speaking Prakrit. Why? Because that is the language of the common folk. Buddha used the language of common people, that is Prakrit languages, especially Pali, which, is, which was the Prakrit of the Magad region, where he was preaching mostly. He went to all the corners of India. It's also in Divamsha and Mahavamsha, it is even said that he visited Ceylon also. It has remained a Buddhist country from the time of Ashoka onwards. Ashoka's own daughter, Sanghamitta. She, when she became a nun, when she became a bhikkhuni in the Sangha of the Buddha, she went to Anuradhapura in Sri Lanka from this Magadh region, Kalinga region, on ship to the Bay of Bengal. And she planted that Bodhi tree at Anuradhapura and she proselytized. She preached the gospel of Buddha and she proselytized that region, Ceylon. So the, it has been a Buddhist country from the time of Ashoka and uh, his daughter Sankhamitta onwards. Even from Kiradi recently, Madurai is the place of Kiradi, where archaeological excavations are going on for the last. Uh, uh, three, four years and plenty of evidences about Sri Lankan kings like uh, Tissa, Devanambhya, Tissa. It is recovered from Dhamma Libi or Brahmi scripts, potsheds, begging bowls as in Patanam for example. It was recovered from Patanam, Patanam where the abundance of potsheds were. Roman amphora to Indian roulette ware to Mediterranean pottery to black and red ware, all these things are Chinese ceramics, everything were recovered from Patanam. Patanam in, in part of the Muziris Greater Heritage Project. Muziris or Kodungalu or Wanchi in Buddhist text. In Mani Meghalai, for example, uh, it is described as Wanchi, Kanji, Kanji Puram, Buddha Kanji and Wanchi. Kanji on the eastern coast, Pumbuhar. Or Kaviri Boom Patanam, which is another port on the eastern coast by the Bay of Bengal. On the western coast, you have Wanchi or Kudungalu or Muziris. It is known in the west, in the Greco Roman world, as Muziris. So, even Greco Roman trade links were the Roman amphora was recovered from Patanam. Dama Libi with a potshed, with a begging bowl, which was brought here, popularized by the nuns, bhikkhunis and bhikkhus, the monks and nuns here. That is the majority of the finding in Patanam. The Patanam ware is nothing but uh, the begging bowl of the Buddha with which he went to uh, that uh, Rahul and Deshodhara. You have that uh, mural. Even today in, in Ajanda, if you go to Ajanda caves, you will find that mural where Buddha comes with that begging bowl uh, to his former wife and uh, and son, he never abandoned the wife and son, but instead he made them equal partners in the Sangha. As Ambedkar has pointed out, it is from Buddha and his Sangha that I derive the modern democratic values of liberty, equality and fraternity. As some of the Hindu Pandits are saying, Buddha has never abandoned uh, his wife. It is Rama who abandoned his pregnant wife amidst the forest. 
even sita was not a watery as kn is talking about today even sita was never a watery of rama he killed shambhuga the shudra now chudras have become the henchmen of rss like the jains even in 1984 anti sikh riots sajan kumar and others jagadish titler rajesh pilot and others they got some kind of nominal punishment after 30 years but the next six or seven culprits are jains you should mark the six innocent six women and children and the aged and even the ailing and diseased people they were lynched and at least 5000 six were executed in 3 days soon after the assassination of indira gandhi in 1984 and when rajiv was questioned he said when big trees fall when big trees fall the earth is bound to shake that is how rajiv gandhi legitimized that anti sikh pogrom and genocide so now the remaining six culprits are jains you should mark the legacy of amit shah it is not just in rss and bjp but even through the congress soft hindu paradigm they were annihilating the so called other one other one mlecha was used against another mlecha so that is such tactics chudra is now being used against our one avarna is turned against another avarna the fallen the nicha will be used against another bahishkrita this is the strategy of varnashrama dhan this is the caste hindu order creating a hierarchical inequality that is why poets are like jati namadigal kalla gunagana bhedam ennalle budhanmarude madam aanu eluthachan thanne parayunnathu enganeyaanu ജാതിയിലും ഈ വർണ്ണാശ്രമ ധർമ്മത്തിലും അല്ല മറിച്ച് വ്യക്തി ഗുണത്തിലാണ് ചൊല്ലേറും വ്യക്തി കാര്യത്തിലല്ലേ ആ ശ്രേഷ്ഠത ഉള്ളത് വ്യക്തി ഗുണങ്ങളിലാണ് മാനവികതയിലാണ് ദ റിയൽ വാല്യൂ ഈസ് ഇൻ ഹ്യൂമാനിറ്റി ദറ്റ് ഈസ് വൈ ഈവൻ നരണ ഗുരു ഹ്യൂമാനിറ്റി ഈസ് ദ കാസ്റ്റ് ഓഫ് ദ ഹ്യൂമൻസ് ലൈക്ക് ബിസ്റ്റിയാലിറ്റി ഈസ് ദ ക്യാരക്ടർ ഓഫ് ദ കൗ but unfortunately the cow is being hailed as the mother and human beings are lynched in the street today so this kind of insanity this kind of intolerance and ignorance of the same species this has befallen on us because of our ignorance our collective forgetfulness the collective amnesia is causing this damage and we need to remember and recover the real legacy of enlightenment the real legacy of writing the real legacy of gender equity the real legacy of social justice liberty equality fraternity the foundational principles of our constitution which is as ambedkar himself the architect the chief architect of the constitution and the modern nation has testified it is from the long tradition the 2600 year of old tradition the real tradition enlightenment tradition of india and also from the west the west has also contributed that's why people like i invoke people like savitri bai and uh, phule and narana guru for example 1914 narana guru in kerala made that historic statement it is the british who gave us the right to education and learning and asceticism it is the british who gave us sanyasam he said because if it was in the time of rama if it was in the ram raj i would have met with the fate of shambhuga he said shambhuga you must remember this is the shudra sage who was brutally butchered by the lord himself for learning the art of letters and teaching the art of letters to the alphabets to other shudra or chandala kids or women that is how he was killed that is why shambhuga was killed he has never done any harm to oru peeda irumbinum varutharudannulla anugambayum ennu narayana guru parayunnathu pole oru urumbine polum noikkatha oru manushya he has never touched even an ant but he learned the art of letters and he taught 
the alphabets to other shudra and chandala kids that is why he was uh, beheaded that is a punishment again you must remember that is the punishment to a shudra who teaches letters and writing to other shudra this is the clear punishment one who le- listens to the letters boiling lead must be poured into his ears ee oriki orikanam aksharam padhipikkunnathu kettal chatambi swamigal angane ana kettu pidichala he was never given an opportunity in the gurugula with the the unnis he was not an unni his father was a brahman but by saying that his mother is a so called shudra woman he was he was denied admission to the the, the sanskritic brahmanical gurugula system but somehow he learned it by listening and he got it from the eluthuvalli tradition eluthachan also belong to that eluthuvalli kalari tradition eluthachan community of course they are having that greater legacy of uh, reading and writing in particular from the buddhist legacy they are from that kadur village in uh, in andhra telangana region and they were expelled from that kadur village because of this writing legacy when hinduism hindutva forces became predominant in 15th century in andhra region they were expelled from there and that is why they came to kerala and they were appointed as the masters the writing uh, and teaching masters of the shudra in in samudris in zamorins uh, uh, abode in kalikat and later you know because the shudras got some kind of envy on him manga tachan and others they developed that envy i am a friend of uh, professor tb vijay kumar the eltachan samajam uh, he was also the principal here now he is the vice president of the samajam i think so i am uh, a close friend of him so i have made this presentation in tunjan param bitsal last year when the tunjan festival was there i have traced this legacy from the kadur village the kadu patters and the patter nadakav and the tunjan paramba and the guru matham here and all those things i have traced that legacy and now there are books on that tradition the buddhist legacy of the eluthachan community eluth writing itself belongs to the buddhist tradition the enlightenment tradition the dhammalipi tradition the ashogan uh, buddhist tradition the the buddhist nuns like mani meghalai for example uh, sangamitai for example they have taught the whole south asia the art of writing that is why the dhammalipi or brahmi has become the mother of all scripts in uh, india and south asia in general so this real legacy of writing which uh, professor tb vijay kumar himself has written he has written plenty of uh, such writings about eluthachan and his writing legacy the community's legacy of writing in bhasha bhoshni and uh, various other uh, periodicals in malayalam there are several publications we must read the writing of at least professor tb vijay kumar on that greater legacy and we need to realize the real legacy of writing and culture the ethical culture egalitarian culture the democratic culture of the people the downtrodden people the people of the subaltern the vast majority of people in india and we have to uphold that ethical and egalitarian enlightenment legacy of india and the world we are all world citizens we cannot be reduced to uh, narrow minded indians we are never votaries of the, this kind of ultra nationalism and jingoism that otherizes our own citizens and our own uh, uh, sisters and brothers we are all brothers and sisters the whole world is one and uh, let us wake up to that reality let us accept that humanity of the whole world and uh, uh, and recover the real cultural legacies of the people and fight against this uh, fascist totalitarian intolerance that is consuming the uh, country today i hope uh, students and uh, young researchers and teachers the academic community in particular especially in this college and the neighborhood you have plenty of things to do uh, against this growing uh, intolerance in our society uh, and i hope we will see a better future uh, thank you very much for uh, listening to me and inviting me here and uh, i'm glad to open your association too thank you